now they have to keep their eyes wide open and have to recognize that people who are like this don't change. That's a real loss of innocence. Until then, they had a really nice view of the world. The world went from being a safe, beautiful, happy garden to a much more treacherous place. If you have ever been in a narcissistic relationship, you completely know what I'm talking about, right? You're just always on edge. Now let's go back. I mean, this is a universal experience we all had. The pandemic taught us this. Certainly in the early, early days of the pandemic, remember all those limits on bleach wipes and toilet paper? We saw people turn their houses into storage bunkers that were meant to withstand the days ahead and I had no idea people would need that many boxes of mac and cheese to withstand the apocalypse. But this isn't only about the pandemic. This has always been a thing. As I was thinking about this video, I remember as a kid in the 1970s, I remember a few times, you know, you were playing with friends and going into the basements and storage sheds and closets of friends while we'd be playing a game of hide and seek or something. And I remember seeing them having shelves and shelves of canned and box foods and paper products. And I even remember going home because my mother didn't do that and saying, mom, we only have like old boxes and like broken appliances and workbench in our basement. Are we going to starve? And she looked at me a little oddly and said, and I'm going to translate this because she wants to speak English. She said, I don't know what they're worried about and we're going to be fine. It was the Cold War era, so maybe people thought like boxes of jello in their basement were going to be enough to withstand that whole issue. So I live in California, earthquake central, and every year we're instructed to have earthquake kits, right? To carry us for a few days and keep them in the house and in the car. And I get it. If all hell broke loose, water and some food and medication would make all the difference in the world, right? We prepare for disasters. And then once we're prepared, we hope that they will never happen. And I would imagine that some people who prepare for disasters in a more comprehensive way, like having half of a Costco in the, their basement or in their garage, must really be thinking the disaster is going to come and they want to eat well. And that means that these folks who have these sort of like storage closet houses, who are they're living as though every day means a decent chance that everything's going to fall apart. You'd have to maybe assume there's some set of not, sense of not relaxing and they're tense and sort of waiting for the sky to fall. It's not an easy way to live, but as a survivor of narcissistic relationships, I absolutely get it. People in narcissistic relationships, forget the hurricanes and earthquakes, you're living in a constant life of disaster prep. And this may be long or short term. In the short term, it means every day you just don't know if the narcissistic person is going to throw a tantrum or what they'll be like when they walk into the door or what's going to set them off. You don't know if today the nice version will show up and then the plans that they want end up falling through and they implode. You may think a nice day will unfold, but then something happens where their entitlement is pinged and then boom, they blow up. When we think about short-term daily preparation for the bad thing to happen in a narcissistic relationship, or even in life, think about it in life, forget the relationship. In life, we lock our doors, we turn on alarms, you make do with what you have for dinner. You adapt, right? And you make yourself safe in whatever way that feels right to you. In a narcissistic relationship to create that sense of safety, that may mean trying to fix the problem. And until you learned about narcissism, you may even have tried to help the narcissistic person feel better when they were throwing a tantrum. It's all good. It'll be okay. Maybe you would reassure them and that would sometimes enrage them further. But that's just the short term. What about in the long term? Because disaster prep, when we think about it, is the doing part. Putting the food in the box or in the closet or in the basement. In some ways, that's the easy part. And frankly, I don't think there's any equivalent to that for the narcissistic relationship other than maybe saving up money for therapy or money to move out, cultivate friendships, create an exit plan. But I recognize that even that may be beyond the reach of many people. This isn't the same thing as stocking up toilet paper. But disaster prep is also the feeling part. And that's the difficult part. When folks are preparing for earthquakes and hurricanes, it's still an unknown if that thing is going to strike, right? And in your lifetime, you may be preparing for an event 
that may not happen or may not be that bad. Like who knows if the big one is ever going to hit California, right? While I'm alive. And while some people live in a chronic state of tension, especially those of you who live in hurricane prone places, or even those of us who live in earthquake prone places, by and large, we adjust. And if we can't adjust, I guess we move. But in a narcissistic relationship, that feeling part of the disaster prep, as it were, is everything. Because your relationship is really about going from an interpersonal explosion to validation, to sunshine, to more invalidation, to gaslighting, to manipulation, to a nice day. So you never really relax. Every conversation is taut and tense, just waiting for that one thing you're going to say that will spin it all away. In keeping with the disaster theme, it would be like if you thought that saying something that would piss the earth off could set it off and then it would start quaking. Now, many folks in narcissistic relationships who cannot leave the relationships learn to make the most of the decent moments. They may learn the times of day that they can get things done. Perhaps they wake up ahead of the narcissistic person or stay up later to get stuff done. They learn that morning might be the time when they're mentally sharper or before the narcissistic person has started their rage episodes. So you get things done before the gaslighting wears you down, right? You are always living in a state of rushing, getting stuff done before the next wave of rain or storm or shaking earth or invasion comes. Instead of calmly going through your day at a reasonable pace, when you're in a narcissistic relationship, you may find that your movements are always abrupt, quickly trying to get things done, putting out fires, getting the kids out the door to school with minimal mishaps so as to not set off the narcissistic person or just taking a breath at the beginning of a holiday meal and trying to eat something so you can get a little food in your stomach before the various narcissistic folks at the table start engaging in their passive or overly aggressive jags. To be in a narcissistic relationship is to forever live in survival mode, living on edge, eating, resting, and working in sort of almost this survivalist manner instead of in a well-paced way. You know, listen, for giggles here, I'll listen to, sometimes I'll actually, believe it or not, go online and listen to lifestyle and wellness folks from time to time to see what they got to say. They always kind of speak kind of slowly and softly and deliberately like this. Today, we're going to help you create a morning routine that will help you create a sense of peace within you and allow your intention to shine. Meanwhile, someone with a nervous system like mine is jumping out of my skin, snapping my fingers, thinking, hop to it, talk faster. I often turn it to two times speed. I can't waste time with this. I don't know when the next problem is coming. And I say that, and it's actually, I don't live in a situation where I'm dealing with narcissistic people on the daily, but it's still in there. And for survivors who may just keep getting that message of, you need to take things slower, that may work when everything around you is safe and calm and seemingly within control. But when things are falling apart and burning down, and they're always falling apart and burning down in these relationships, you aren't breathing and thinking of intentions. If it's really a disaster, you're grabbing the pets and running, and you're always living in that state of activation. Narcissistic relationships slide into your nervous system. So even when the relationship is gone, there is still this on edge, waiting for the disaster to come, survivalist way of going through the world. People in or affected by these relationships are forever in a sense of what can go wrong. And you may never peaceably go through life, but you may forever feel you're on your back foot, rushing through the calms and the storm to be ready for the storm. And that's a great strategy for getting through a hurricane, but it's not a sustainable way to get through life. And yet that's the legacy for many survivors of these kinds of relationships. And trauma bonding can mean that we still care too much about what the narcissistic person thinks or how they're doing or what other people think. And it's really difficult 
to break through these cycles. We hold these relationships viscerally and as a result are on alert to either hide or get out or not make things worse. There's certainly no calmness in that. If only there was the equivalent of cans of beans and jugs of water for preparing for the down days of the narcissistic relationship. Many survivors sometimes wish they could be less frantic all the time, less reactive when things go wrong, calmer all the time. But it's hard to achieve that when you're always waiting for the next explosion. When you feel, in essence, like you have to be ready to scurry or retreat. Sometimes the best we can do is to be kinder to ourselves. Ideally, maybe not turn to content that's based on a world that's free of threats and is within your control. It takes time to shift how we think, for our emotions to settle and for our bodies to heal. And that survival closet is a lot more complex to stock when that's the way you have to live. So at a minimum, just be nicer to yourself and recognize that if you are still showing up in life, despite that running script of how you aren't enough and that there is something wrong with you, then frankly, you're doing great. And it's really this, this video came to a, a finer point for me. I was packing a suitcase this morning and I had to pack a small suitcase because I, I don't want to check a bag because of the nature of the travel I'm doing. And I often struggle with doing that. I look at people who pack light and I'm always sort of astonished by them. And I'm thinking some of the things I wanted to bring, it really was like I was preparing for a siege, like all these things that could go wrong. I need this, but if this goes wrong, what if this goes wrong? What if this goes wrong? What if this goes wrong? And I caught myself thinking about this video that I would be making and I thought, here we go. I was always preparing for the, for the sort of the other shoe falling. I was always preparing for things to go wrong, which always meant I had a crowded suitcase. And so I thought to myself, if it did go wrong, then you might end up wearing the same shirt for a few days. If it did go wrong, you'll watch, wash the underwear in the sink. If it does go wrong, you'll find a store to buy this thing in You'll borrow it, you'll figure it out. But that fear that if you're not fully prepared and that sort of sky is falling feeling that is always in the narcissistic relationship, especially if this has been going on for a lot of your lifetime, it's very hard to break. So I listened to my own video and let me tell you, I got that carry on bag packed with room to spare and you can too. This particular proverb was sent in by a viewer. It's originally a Russian proverb. You know who you are who sent it in, so thank you so much. I had not heard this proverb before, but when I read it, I really thought it was wonderful. And I definitely can see that it has relevance for understanding the process of healing from narcissistic abuse in, in actually a rather clever way. So let's start with what, what this proverb means. Basically, if you get burned in one place, you keep waiting for it to happen in others and you generalize it into a range of situations. At one level, it is also a proverb that helps us understand post-trauma. After people experience trauma, a mistrustfulness, not only for o about other people, but also not trusting yourself, almost always impacts a person. And one could argue that narcissistic abuse is its own form of trauma that carries its own form of post-trauma. But this is a proverb about not knowing who or what to trust. And it is one of the biggest issues raised by people who are trying to heal and recover from narcissistic abuse. There tend to be two paths that a person can go down after experiencing narcissistic abuse. One is unresolved trauma bonds, which may mean even after getting out of one narcissistic relationship, a person might find, might find themselves repeating the cycle of a narcissistic relationship and choosing yet another narcissistic relationship. The other pathway is extreme caution. This proverb sort of concerns itself with that second path, 
But just FYI, just a reminder, this is why I'm such a big believer in a period of solitude and the importance of not getting into new, new relationships while you are still recovering from narcissistic abuse. It's such, so important so that you can do the working through and understanding and dissolving the trauma-bonded vulnerabilities while you are on your own and not while someone else can take advantage of those vulnerabilities again, or you still feel like you're needing to cater to the needs of another human being. But that second path of not feeling like you can trust yourself, trust someone else, or seeing red flags everywhere, that path is actually pretty common. Many people feel that they are living in f fear of all of that just happened in a narcissistic relationship, all of that happening again. Anything that even feels a little generous during an initial courtship raises fears of love bombing. If the person is insistent, does that mean they're bad with boundaries? There may also be a lack of trust to a point of suspiciousness. So even if things are going smoothly and healthily in a new relationship, a fear of being betrayed or lied to or being taken advantage of still persists, blowing on the water after burning your lips on the hot milk. I tell most survivors of narcissistic abuse that being guarded and requiring slow moving trust building is very, very normal. The greater that the betrayals were in the narcissistic relationship, the longer that this process can take. You may need more and more episodes that establish and cement that trust in a new relationship. To which I say, that's fine. Be patient with yourself. I do think that there is sometimes a sort of societal pressure to hurry up and trust. For survivors of narcissistic abuse, that is simply not an option. Trust building takes time and you need to give yourself that time. Many times people feel that they are being too slow to trust or too cynical and they judge themselves. And that is dangerous because then there is a risk of throwing yourself into a new relationship or situation too quickly and having the sense of, I need to hurry up and trust. The question always is, will I trust again? Yeah, I think you probably will, but probably not like you did before. In the healthiest possible scenario after narcissistic abuse, you will always be aware and self-advocating and give yourself permission to question things that don't feel safe or good, and also to recognize patterns such as gaslighting, future faking, and invalidating. That doesn't mean that you don't trust. It simply means that you're being a good gatekeeper and protecting yourself. Blowing on the water after being burned by hot milk is a balancing act. While you do not want to chastise a new person in your life for the sins of the narcissist before them, you do want to create a space where you feel safe. So how do you do that? Time. If a relationship or a person is healthy, then they will give you that time to establish that trust. If they cannot do that, then you may be once again sort of witnessing that rushing stuff we see in love bombing. You can do this. You can build that trust up by looking at the slow accumulation of events that establish trust. If after weeks and months, the person's behavior remains respectful, aware, empathic, reciprocal, pay attention to that accumulation. Don't become complacent, but at a, face, at, a, at a pace that feels right to you, slowly open up. You'll see that over time, despite have, burning your lips on that hot milk, you will slowly stop blowing on that proverbial water. 
as the healthy stuff of a relationship presents itself. Res again, respect, compassion, kindness, mutuality of regard, reciprocity, patience, humility. That becomes the foundation of trust. And this may be such new territory to you that you don't know what to do with it. Breathe into it. And it's like preparing a canvas to paint on it. This good stuff becomes the foundation for building trust and not seeing the water as hot milk. A little blowing on the water after burning yourself on hot milk may not be a bad thing. Take it slow. However, also give yourself time after a narcissistic relationship to heal and recover, to trust yourself, and to also expunge the toxicity of the former relationship. If you move too quickly, it may not be about a lack of trust as much as still responding to the trauma of the original narcissistic relationship. And there also stands the risk of accusing a new potentially healthy partner of things of doing things that they are not doing. Building trust with another human being starts with trusting yourself. And so many people leave narcissistic relationships feeling and believing that they betrayed themselves. No, that's not what you did. You were betrayed. And the self-blame results in you turning that back on yourself. The more you learn to trust you, the more or the better able you are to spot red flags, to give a new relationship time to breathe, to give yourself permission to set boundaries, to recognize a gaslight for what it is, to recognize that you are good alone if you need to be, to recognize the dissonance and the justifications, and to look for the stuff that makes a healthy relationship. It's a stepwise process. Trust is something that is earned, and building a foundation takes time. Survivors do take more time to trust. It's true. We do need to keep blowing on the water. But perhaps there's a wisdom on that. You certainly don't want to burn your lips again. After you have been through narcissistic abuse, you no, long, you no longer feel safe. It's a very classical part of the profile of narcissistic abuse. Now, I, by lack of safety, I don't mean that you think that someone is standing behind you with a weapon, though you may feel that metaphorically, but just a general lacking lack of a sense of psychological safety with other people. Some of this relates to the difficulties with trust, which is also a part of narcissistic abuse, which is another video in this series, but it goes beyond that. Lack of safety is a discomfort. Like I said, it extends beyond, it goes beyond just not being able to trust people. It's a mishmash of stuff, a cynicism, a fear of speaking your mind, a reticence, or a sort of holding back. Yeah, a lack of trust, a feeling like you can't completely exhale, a fear of being gaslighted again. You simply, fear, you simply feel as though you can't let your guard down. Remember, when you entered any narcissistic relationships volunteer, voluntarily, typically you entered these as an adult. And as a result, it's easy to feel like you were played, that you were tricked, or that you're even foolish, which you're not. And that can leave you feeling unsafe, as though you can't trust your own instincts after making that big mistake. After being gaslighted, not just by your partner, but by other people around you, the narcissist enablers, people around you who just don't get it, the almighty gaslighting by tribe that I've talked about, you may just not know who to believe anymore. It messes with your head and makes it so that you're always looking with a bit of suspiciousness around you. 
it's like one of those crime movies where nobody quite trusts anybody and everyone's kind of on edge. It's a very exhausting way to live, especially since you're not trying to live like you're in a crime movie. If you grew up in a narcissistic family system, lack of safety is pretty much sort of baked into you. Because your development was characterized by confusion, conditional regard, val invalidation, you didn't know, you never knew what was going to set off the rage in one or both of your parents. As a result, you never really felt safe. You may have been attempting to be a peacemaker so things wouldn't escalate when you were a kid, or you felt like you had to hide yourself because you were the scapegoat. Either way, nobody feels safe in these family systems. And when you grow up feeling unsafe, that trails you into adulthood in a million subtle ways. Safety is the second level of Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Remember like food, and sh food on the bottom and then on and on and on. In fact, the only fundamental level that's deeper than safety is food and water. To be safe is an essential human need and we devote a lot of psychological resources to it if it isn't coming easily. So feeling unsafe is really awful for a human being. And that, sadly, is one of the long-term legacies of narcissistic abuse. Other videos in this series highlight symptoms and patterns such as hypervigilance, that kind of on-edgeness, which we do observe in people experiencing narcissistic abuse. And that pattern also gets at that on-edge sort of lack of safety feeling. The lack of safety means that people don't quite feel in their skin and also means that it can be quite difficult to establish new relationships, especially after a narcissistically abusive one ends or if you still have narcissistically abusive relationships in your lives. People who have experienced narcissistic abuse may initially only stick to the tried and true people in their life. They may regard new people with suspicion. In fact, many people who have been through narcissistic abuse will say that they fear that they will never fully feel at ease or fully feel safe with new people. It's not surprising. After being through narcissistic abuse, in some way, sadly, you not only stop trusting yourself, you also stop trusting other people and you never quite feel safe. The challenging part of narcissistic abuse is that although it happens to so many people, so many more people just don't get it. So you will often get pushback from people who say, ugh, narcissistic abuse, that's not even a thing, or get over it, you're out of the relationship now, what are you still talking about this for? Or, oh really, well they never hit you, so what are you so, anxious about? What are you talking about this lack of safety? Sometimes things just don't work out. It's the daily gaslighting and confusion and invalidation and the narcissist's unwillingness to take responsibility or ownership for their behavior that turns the whole thing upside down and makes it unlike any other kind of psychological pain you could experience in a relationship. The lack of safety, the sense of a lack of safety, results in a sort of what we'd call a tentativeness. It's almost like a person who is very carefully putting their foot into a swimming pool or another body of water. Is it cold? Is it safe? It's a sort of a carefulness, a slowness, and that's okay. So what do you do if you are experiencing this sense of a lack of safety? First of all, please be patient with yourself. I must say for many people who have been through narcissistic abuse, there is sadly often a bit of a lifelong legacy of never quite ever feeling completely safe. 
it, it'll maybe always take you just a little bit longer to warm up, to feel okay with other people, to trust them, to let your guard down. And that's okay. Don't put yourself on other people's schedule and other people's sort of agenda. Safety, that sense of safety may happen with time, but perhaps by being a little bit more on guard at the beginning, you may also protect yourself and keep the gates closed on another narcissist or toxic person getting too close to you. Secondly, start small. After a narcissistic relationship, or even while you are still in one and enduring narcissistic abuse, start making, you know, start making inroads again with your own friend group. It's easy to get isolated when you are in a narcissistic relationship. So at a minimum, at least reflect on how safe you feel with people you have known for a while. Third, I want you to consider doing my, practicing mindfulness and meditation. These are wonderful daily practices and sometimes just staying in the present moment and just reacting to the things that are in front of you and working on your breathing in that moment can give you a sense of your own inner world and self-possession and can build your sense of safety from the inside out. Fourth, consider exercise. Somehow getting stronger can build a sense of safety from the outside in. Lift, build muscle. Also consider things like walking, fill your heartbeat. If you can create strength from the outside in and from the inside out, you might start feeling in better ownership and also better ownership of your safety. And even though you may still feel that sort of lingering sense of a lack of safety from narcissistic abuse, doing these kinds of things can help you create a little bit more of a defense against this and maybe feel a little bit safer, at least with yourself, and then slowly, hopefully, with the world. So let's talk a little bit about this because personally I think it's a luxury and a privilege to be able to maintain an exceedingly positive moonbeams, rainbows, unicorn, everyone's just really a good person at the heart of it view of human nature. So let me share this, my, the thinking on this with you by way of story, okay? I'm a cynic. You don't do what I do for a living without being one. You can't see the stuff I see without saying, oh my gosh. But over time, Oh, instead of seeing myself as a cynic, I prefer to think of myself as a realist. And I get it, being a realist is also an equally sour brand. Obviously, I wouldn't be as passionate about what I do if I had not survived my share of narcissistic abuse. That's a fact. But for much of my life, I really have to say, I have deeply disliked what survivorship did to me. I didn't always love who I was and what I, what, I would, what I would say for a long time. And I have to say on some bad days, I still do this. I really envy the people, really envy them. The people who could say, I can see the good in everyone, or they're just cheerful. And they were just able to get along with really toxic people and it didn't bother them. And let's just be gentle with everyone because they've been through a lot. And there was just sunshiny and huggy and friendly and joiny and they'd give people second chances and for years in fact I'd say for most of my life I thought there was something really wrong with me and I walk around calling myself heartless or mean and I got to tell you more than a few people over the years have called me petty cynical unyielding and unempathic and I hate being called those things I don't think they're true that was their experience of me so I'm not going to challenge it but I really, really wanted to be that cheerful person who just took the everything's great, life is great, it's really all perfect kind of gal. I'm not. I am half empty glass until I die. I know that about me. It took me over 50 years to accept this piece of myself. 
but I'm fine, if it, fine with it now. It's a representation, this sort of cynicism of my experiences with people, of, of, of watching the enabling and the gaslighting, and more importantly, I think it was affected more, even more, what happened to me by watching how much it happened to other people. I think that's the part that really broke my heart. It has taken an introvert, and I am an introvert, and it has, over my life, it turned me into even more of a hermit because I actually started getting a little bit more scared of human relationships. Because one of the hardest experiences I witness people going through in the wake of narcissistic abuse is the loss of innocence that going through narcissistic abuse and actually understanding narcissistic abuse, what that does to a person. Over the years, I have worked with countless people who in their lives had always viewed themselves as empaths, as very empathic. They were helpers. They would help people out and they got sucked dry, sucked dry by the narcissists around them. And then they finally woke up. Something led these empaths, these survivors to their rock bottom and they woke up to it. Some people didn't get the lesson straight out of the gate. They didn't get it just after their first narcissistic relationship and they went back in and they either got hoovered or they started rescuing yet another person who was gaslighting and manipulating them. Sometimes it takes a few cracks at bat to get this. Or they would just simply let a new narcissist into their life. And then they had to go through the whole healing and learning drill again. But ultimately it was hard. Not just because setting boundaries is hard, but because it was a shift in their identity. There are many survivors of narcissistic abuse out there who derive so much identity from being the helper, sometimes cases being the savior, but being the helper, the overextender of favors, the doers, that to recognize that it's no longer an option to walk around rescuing people and that now they have to keep their eyes wide open and have to recognize that people who are like this don't change. That's a real loss of innocence. Until then, they had a really nice view of the world. The world went from being a safe, beautiful, happy garden to a much more treacherous place. And in that garden, now there are narcissists lurking amongst the daisies and the daffodils. I don't like to think of this as, as being hard-heartedness or cynicism. I think when people come through narcissistic abuse, they become discerning, wise, and yeah, it is sad. It does, it is sad that we have to so carefully, yeah, and cynically assess the people who come into our worlds to be careful. We also need to be aware of our vulnerabilities and be comfortable with laying down a boundary rather than falling into the comfortable warm bath of denial. But it is a loss of innocence. You are no longer the sweet trusting baby who will crawl into someone else's arms, even a stranger's arms. But now you're the more suspicious toddler who's a lot more discerning and holds back. You ain't just going to walk off with anyone. And while I hate to think that the proliferation of narcissism and other difficult and toxic personalities turns the world into one big stranger danger campaign, at a minimum, it, we can find, or people can find themselves to m more of a... Um, uh, more of a being discerning. Now, living through a narcissistic relationship and seeing it clearly is in many ways a coming of age story. The moment when you can learn that you do not have to fall down the usual trauma bonded sinkholes and can release that childlike innocence for adult-like reticence and wisdom to recognize that second chances and forgiveness have their place and their recipients in healthy people. But sadly, we can't just pay and play this all out equally. The forgiveness that can be absolutely transformative for one friend and one friendship can be absolutely enabling and toxic with another friend. 
you got to learn the differences. This loss of innocence is part of the healing process. Many people find it quite destabilizing because they start seeing these toxic patterns more and more. What started, for example, maybe just seeing it in a partner expands to recognizing that, wow, this wasn't just my partner. This is my mom. This is my sister. This is my freeloading friend. This is my conniving coworker. Like, shoot, this is a lot of people like this. The people you may have spent years and years making excuses for. Oh, she doesn't mean it. He's lonely. Uh, she doesn't know how to ask people things. You've kept making the excuses. You kept getting in deeper. Loss of innocence, coming of age. These are all essential steps, honestly, in any hero's journey, if you want to use that terminology. And surviving this kind of toxic behavior from people, frankly, it is heroic. Anyone who can see it and calmly recognize it, even if it means just simply not responding, respectfully turning down the invitation from the toxic person or where the toxic person will be, not engaging, and not participating in all this second chance revisionism, as far as I'm concerned, that's heroic in this day and age. And let's face it, adulthood is not meant to be innocent. Adulthood is meant to be wise. So I think for all of you who are struggling, like, I don't like this person I'm becoming. And Dr. Romney, while your videos are all good and well, I don't like this. Like, I don't want to be that person who, who's like, mm, I always have to be a little bit suspicious. Sometimes it's all about how you, how you word it. So this is suspicious. Try discerning. And also knowing that toxic patterns are often, these so-called red flags, they're a sign. So instead of, it may feel like a loss of innocence, and I know there's some grief around that. Losing things and growing go together, just like the snake that sheds its skin. We as people shed our skin too, as we shed these toxic patterns and can grow into someone healthier. Not everyone gets to go on the whole ride with you. Hope that gives some clarity for those of you who are struggling with a sort of sense of, I'm no longer, I'm no longer Little Miss Sunshine. It's okay. You can be Little Miss Partly Cloudy and everything's going to be fine.